In 2 Chronicles 6, Israel had just completed building the temple in Jerusalem. And King Solomon was on a high altar in front of all the people with a slain lamb. And he offered the prayer of dedication. And when he said, Amen, fire came from heaven and consumed the burnt offering in view of all of Israel gathered to worship. The glory of God was so thick in smoke that the priest could not enter the new temple. Israel had a week-long celebration, celebrating the completion of Solomon's temple. Things were going great. The people had never been happier. Offerings were huge. And it's exactly at this point that God spoke in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. He said this, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. At the time God spoke these words, Israel was the leading superpower. Even Egypt's queen of Sheba made the long trip to Jerusalem to see what their secret was for their worldwide success. But good Bible students, which most of us are, we know that within 175 years of God's warning in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God's people, the Israelites, became so morally corrupt, so depraved, that God permitted the northern kingdom to fall to the Assyrians. And they're known today as the ten lost tribes of Israel. A little over a hundred years later, God permitted the southern kingdom to fall to the Babylonians, who destroyed Jerusalem, burned down the temple, carried thousands of the Israelites off for 70 years of bondage in Babylon. History shows that the average age of the world's greatest civilizations is about 200 years. Considering America from 1776 to 2021 is 245 years. It's difficult not to compare the apostasy we see in our own Christian nation with the apostasy of Israel. But here's the thing. Nations don't just arbitrarily disappear. Nations are made up of people. And when the majority of people who live in the nation turns their backs on God, then God permits the nation to cease to exist. That's how God stems the tide of evil in our world. America stands today as the world's superpower, just like Israel stood 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. In the United States Census for April 1, 2020, there were 331,449,281 Americans 205 million of them identify as Christians. That means that 62% of our nation, the majority, claim to be Christians. 32% identify as non-Christians, atheists, Buddhists, or, or nothing. And 5.6% of our nation identify as part of the LGBTQ culture or community. Now, the 32% plus the 5.6% adds up to 38%. So we might ask ourselves, how 38% of our population has so much power over the 62% majority in the legislative halls of our nation. It comes down to this. 
62% desperately need a revival for survival. The 38% have the power because as we know, just watch your TV, they are on fire to convince others of their point of view and they demand legislation for what they believe in. The 62% of Christians of which we're part, we don't seem to really care enough about the salvation of that 38% to kick up a fuss and be passionate about convincing them of the gospel message of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We don't bother to tell them of the life that is planned for them in the world to come. Do we need a revival? Definitely. You know, our hearts should be breaking for that 38% that will be lost without learning about God who loves them, without learning that he sent his son into the world to die for them. Most of the 38% who are not Christians have actually, actually have no idea that Satan is a real being who is literally trying to destroy them. Many don't even realize that their behaviors are sinful. They have no knowledge that Jesus is returning soon. They have no idea that their destiny is hanging in the balance. What are we going to do about it? Jesus said in Luke 19.10 that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Christ has called his people, that's you and me, to do the same. Seeking the lost is our only mission. This church has no other mission. Everything we do is to the point of seeking and saving for the purpose of seeking and saving those that are lost. So, why do we fail to tell everybody we meet the good news of the gospel? When we know seeking the, say to the lost is our only mission, why do we fail to tell everybody? Our excuse is we're so overwhelmed with busyness of our own lives. We're busy people. We're busy families. We're, we're busy church members. We're busy, 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 which probably explains why America leads the world in divorce, violence, pornography, illegal drug trafficking, self-improvement seminars, and a raging passion for pleasure and personal comfort. You see, most of us in the 62% are simply too busy inside our individual bubbles of life to give a whole lot of thought to the salvation of others, much less take time to kneel down and passionately pray for them. And this lack of passionate prayer on our part gives Satan an absolutely clear field in which to operate. Failure to pray leaves Satan's legions of evil angels free to attack individuals every moment of every day? Does it even resonate with our thinking? You see, instead of hating sin for what it has done to the human race, instead of hating it because it cost the life of the Son of God, we've actually made peace with it. We've watered it down. We've acted as if there is no devil who goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But the problem is, most of us have lost the urge to resist. Everybody is doing it. So calm down. Go with the flow. Stop shoving religion down my throat. I want to be free, but there's no such thing as freedom. There are only two masters. There's God and Satan, and they are locked in 
deadly mortal combat for our soul. And each of us has a choice. We get to choose who will rule our life. But the majority has served Satan for so long that wicked behaviors and attitudes have become accepted as normal to the point where Christians hardly even notice them. I'm not talking just about morality. You know, that plagues our homes, a church, our nation, that we primarily now ignore lest we offend someone. I'm also talking about pride and self-seeking and gossip and envy. You know, the everyday sins that are eating the soul out of Christ's body of believers and hindering the revival that we desperately need to be effective witnesses for him. The Bible clearly tells us that sin separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 2, your sins have hidden God's face from you so that he will not hear. Psalm 66, 18, if we cherish sin, one sin in our heart, God doesn't hear us when we pray. You know, in the last month, I've had two people tell me they are in relationships that are not biblically what they should be. And in both instances, they said to me, I'm okay with God. I have a good relationship with God. And being I'm the very sweet person I am, I said, no, you're not. You're fooling yourself. Because if you are indulging in an open sin that the Bible clearly states is wrong, and you think you're okay with God, you are truly fooling yourself, and you are on dangerous ground. You do not have a wonderful relationship with Jesus if you are not obeying his word. Here's the Bible's prescription for eternal life. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you do that, now you have a relationship with God. I'm not judging. People say, well, you're, ju you're judging me. Because you know what? It doesn't matter what I think about what you're doing. It doesn't matter what you think about what you're doing. It only matters what the Word of God says. That's the yardstick for everything we do in our life. I actually feel sorry for people that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Because those of you that work out in the public know that they're tired, they're angry, they're unsettled, they're fearful, they're fighting, they're unholy. They're people that never find peace. We have the answer to how they can be at peace and live happily ever after. We introduce them to Jesus. We share with them, come to Jesus just as you are. Come in your weakness, your brokenness, your general sinful state, just as we do inside the church, knowing that he accepts each person that calls on him despite our sins. That's the difference. Everybody sins. So what makes me in a better position than the average Jane and Joe out in the world? I confess my sins. And he is faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. That's the difference, is our confession of our sins because we love him. You know, when we introduce people to Jesus, that's when they will discover, as we all have, that the Christian life isn't a modification of your lifestyle. You know, I'll just give up drinking. I'll just give up smoking. That's not a modification of your lifestyle. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, 
a revival within our mind occurs, a revival that actually transforms our sinful nature. There will be death to self and sin and a new life altogether in Jesus Christ. That's revival. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man, any of us, are in Jesus Christ, we're a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. What's stopping us from preaching to America with the same power and fire as those proclaiming a satanic message straight from the pit of hell? Unfortunately, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been so watered down that most people now believe that God will save them in their sins rather than from their sins. Only a return to calling sin by its real name will allow the Holy Spirit of truth to penetrate the minds of people. The Bible says we shall know the truth and the truth will set us free, John 8, 32. If that's true, why are we so afraid to speak the truth? If our loved one was asleep on the railroad tracks and a train was barreling at them at 100 miles an hour, what would we do? Would we say, oh, I don't want to wake them up lest I offend them? Or would we go after getting that person off the track, whether we offended them or not? See, Jesus made it clear in Matthew 5, 13 and 16 that we are called to be light and salt in this world, to shine for him so that everybody sees his glory and power through our lives. So if we're called to be salt and light, why do we try to turn it into sugar and shadows just so we please everybody around us. When God gives us the revival we're seeking, I promise you that the Holy Spirit will rock our boats with the plain testimony of Jesus. I also promise you that there are some who do not want to be rocked and will not like it. Revelation 3.17 says that just before Jesus comes, we will believe we are rich, increase with goods and have need of nothing when in fact we are wretched miserable poor blind and naked do you know i've never ever in my life had anybody tell me that revelation 317 was their favorite bible verse i'm likely never to hear that i don't want to be part of that description when Jesus comes. Do you? Did you know that there have only been two great national revivals in America, which historians call spiritual awakenings? First in 1734 in New England, Jonathan Edwards, highly educated minister, wore very thick lens glasses, started the first revival. He read his sermons word for word in a monotone voice, rarely using a gesture. But he was a passionate prayer warrior for the salvation of the people of this newly formed nation. The power of God was so strong through his preaching that men and women cried out and literally grabbed the back of their chairs to keep from falling down in agony over their sins. When is the last time you agonized over one of your sins? In a short time, one-third of the people of the 13 colonies were converted to Jesus Christ. The spiritual awakening fanned the flames of the revolution that secured our nation's independence from England. The second Great Awakening, that revival began around 1840 in New York in the Midwest. After the Revolutionary War, after the War of 1812, thousands of new settlers came to America and again, sin and wickedness ruled in most of the pioneer regions. 
These were the days of camp meetings where everybody lived in a tent for a couple of weeks. One camp meeting took place in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. The whole region had a population of about 50,000, yet there were over 25,000 people at that camp meeting gathered in August. James Finley, a Methodist preacher, described what he saw, what he witnessed, when he pulled into that camp meeting. He said, the noise was like the roar of the Niagara. I counted seven ministers all preaching at one time around the campground. Some were preaching standing on stumps, others were standing up in the back of wagons, and one was even standing on a tree that had been blown over. Some people were singing, others were praying, some were crying for mercy while others were shouting the glory of God. A strange supernatural power seemed to invade the entire mass of people. Finley saw at least 500 people fall on their faces in prayer and then immediately there were shouts and prayers, he said, that rent the heavens. As this revival spread throughout the young nation, a lawyer named Charles Finney was converted. He started traveling, his entire life changed, and he started traveling around the country from city to city, putting up a tent and holding meetings. And entire cities of people were converted. When he entered a city, he preached about Jesus dying on the cross. He preached the gospel, and he preached the need to repent before you leave my meeting tonight. And he also converted thousands of people. Finney also preached against social injustice, including slavery and child labor. This great revival gave birth to the attitudes a few years later that led to the Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln. These are the kinds of things that happened in genuine Holy Spirit-filled revival. Individuals were converted, Christians were restored to their walk with God, cities were changed, entire cultures were affected. Do it again, Lord. Do I have an amen? amen? Do it again. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, ignite a spiritual awakening in our hearts to spread across Charlotte throughout America. Do it again, Lord, using us. We've been given the formula for success. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. You know, revival is not a mystery. When we lower the temperature to 32 degrees, ice forms. It's just as certain when we humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face, when we repent, God will hear us, he will forgive our sins, he will heal our land. We're told that a true revival, a revival of true godliness among us, is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. I wonder tonight how many of us are burdened enough for our soul, for the souls of our family, our friends, our church, our nation, just to get out of the pews and come down front and pray for a revival to begin with us. Revival begins in the quietness of our minds with the confession of all of our known sins. If we're willing to confess our sins and seek God's face, we will begin a revival. 
that will not end until Jesus comes.